Jay Air will be hosting a very significant event, on Wednesday evening, March 15th. This will be a live discussion at 11 p.m. between Professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz and Professor Eugene Kontaravich, two esteemed legal experts. The topic will be the perceived threats to Israel's democracy as a consequence of the proposed reforms to Israel's judicial system and the potential impact to the power of the Supreme Court in particular. The event will be moderated by David Schulberg, the presenter of the Israel Connection program on JR. Registration numbers are limited, so if you are interested, please go to the JR website, j-air.com.au, to register. You are listening to JR, 88 FM. You are listening to a JR special event. So I'm here in the studios of J Air in Melbourne, Australia, and I welcome all our listeners that have joined us on the Zoom event and other listeners who are listening on the radio on 88FM or perhaps on the J Air website, which is being streamed live on uh, the internet. So I have with me today as uh, the audience can see, two highly esteemed legal experts whose love for Israel is unquestionable. Professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz is an American lawyer and former law professor known for his work in US constitutional law and American criminal law. From 1964 to 2013, he taught at Harvard Law School where he was appointed the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law back in 1993. Professor Dershowitz is a regular media contributor, political commentator and legal analyst. An ardent Zionist and supporter of Israel, Professor Dershowitz has written several books on the Arab-Israeli conflict. I could say so much more about your very distinguished legal career, Professor Dershowitz. I welcome you to the special discussion coming to you under the auspices of J.E. Community Radio in Melbourne, Australia. So welcome, welcome to you, Professor Dershowitz. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be on. I love both Israel and Australia, so I'm happy to have audiences in both of those countries. Well, it's great to have you. We spoke uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, it's great to be able to uh, speak with you again so soon. Now, also in the picture is uh, Professor Eugene Kodorovich, who was born in Kiev, Ukraine, and at the age of three, I think you moved to the U.S. with your parents. Uh, you migrated to, or you immigrated to Israel in 2013 with your wife and four children. You're a, a proponent of using anti-BDS laws to combat the BDS movement. Uh, you have helped many U.S. states draft such legislation. You are a fellow of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and you head the International Law Department at the Kohelet Policy Forum. I welcome you to the special discussion event coming to you live from our studio here in Melbourne. So welcome, Professor Kondorovich. Uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure. And actually I actually was interviewed for uh, ABC, Australian Broadcast News uh, segment, which I think is going to air tonight for your Australian audience. Pleasure to be with you. Oh, that is uh, most interesting and we'll be looking out for that. Well, I feel extremely honoured to have the opportunity to bring you two together to deal with the topic of the perceived threats to Israel's democracy that are associated with the Netanyahu governing coalition that is moving to introduce what are widely viewed as judicial reforms that will seriously impact on the checks and balances between the legislative, executive and judicial branches of Israel's parliamentary democracy. The doctrine of separation of powers was popularized by Montesquieu in 1748 in his work L'Esprit de, de Loi. The doctrine held that there were three essentially different powers of government, legislative, executive and judicial, and that a country's liberty depended on each of these powers being vested in a separate body. The theory had a marked effect on subsequent parliamentary and governmental development in democratic societies. And uh, on that subject, that's about as much as, as I know, and I think I'll defer to both you, uh, Professor Dershowitz and Professor Kontorovich, to continue in that vein. So to get the ball rolling, uh, perhaps uh, 
you, uh, Professor Dershowitz, can answer why is there so much dissension in Israel at the moment over the proposed judicial reforms that the governing coalition in Israel is trying to introduce? Well, first of all, it's not about the proposals. It's about who's making the proposals. If exactly the same proposals had been made by a centrist government or left-wing government, uh, no one would notice. There'd be no demonstrations. There'd be some academic discussion. Eugene and I might be debating this, and uh, uh, it would be interesting. Uh, law school teachers would be teaching it, but no one would care. No one would be out on the street. In my 60 years of attention to these issues, I've never heard of a demonstration about judicial reform. For example, when the United States overruled, Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade, the Biden administration and people outside the Biden administration debated and talked about packing the Supreme Court, limiting the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, age restrictions on the Supreme Court, term limits. Nobody cared. Uh, there were a few debates uh, about some of these issues. I wrote op-eds about it. But nobody would think about ever bringing judicial reform to the streets. So it's not about judicial reform. It's about the fact that judicial reform is being brought about by a government that frightens a lot of people, a government that includes some extreme right wing people who seem to have uh, less tolerance for principles of human rights, principles of equal protection, principles of minority rights. Um, and one more point. This is not about democracy. Um, you know, Montesquieu's point was picked up by a number of countries like the United States. It was rejected by most European countries, which simply have parliamentary systems that don't separate the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative. It's all legislative. And so if all of these reforms were enacted, and I oppose most, but not all of them, if all of these reforms were enacted, it would turn Israel into, God forbid, Canada or New Zealand, or Australia, or many European countries. It would not turn them into, into Poland. It would not turn them into autocratic countries. Um, I believe that there are extremes on both sides, that, uh, that there is a need for compromise, there is a need for some reform, and I'll propose what I think the appropriate reform uh, would be and should be, but this would not undercut democracy. In some respects, it would make Israel more democratic because it would mean majority rules on everything. But for me, a good democracy, a good democracy requires not only majority rule, but minority rights, uh, due process, uh, freedom of speech, equal protection. And I think that a proposal to weaken substantially the judiciary would compromise those values. It would not compromise democracy. It might increase democracy but it would compromise values that I think are very important in a democracy. And I think that's where the arguments between Eugene and myself, and by the way, I respect his work enormously. His work on BDS has been monumental and really important. And I agree with him, I think on what, 70, 80%. I'm a traditional liberal Democrat. He's a more traditional uh, conservative. And, and one thing I'm thrilled that we're having a debate about this. I don't want to be out on the streets screaming and yelling and shouting cliches. I would rather be having a rational, coherent discussion between two academics, both of whom love Israel, both of whom have great respect for constitutional law, but we differ on fundamental issues. And that's what debate and discussion is all about. So thank you for sponsoring it. Well, when we organized this uh, event, uh, you wanted it to be a discussion and not a debate but you're still uh, somehow alluding to it, to being in debate. Anyway, let, I'll hand over, over to uh, Professor Kondorovic perhaps to respond on this point. Uh, what's happened to you? It's frozen. Uh, and um, I've listened very carefully to what Professor Dershowitz uh, has uh, said on these uh, subjects. Uh, and I think some of his comments have been, you know, greatly mischaracterized as a, uh, it's clear none of us think this would be the end of Israeli democracy. There's a question, you know, what are the proper reforms for Israel to take? Um, and before I discuss that question, you know, I, I think uh, one thing that comes out of the general agreement, uh, uh, I think, between Professor, Professor Dershowitz and I, that it would not be the end of the world, 
uh, you know, it would be maybe uh, Holland or, or Canada, which isn't necessarily the right thing to do, right? Or maybe it'll be closer to the United States. That's not necessarily the system you want. But what it does mean is the interest of the world community in this is completely fundamentally uh, misguided and probably motivated by, you know, the uh, not good things that uh, motivate the traditional excess mm -hmm. international interest in Israel. Um, I agree. There's no reason for the there's no reason for the EU High Commissioner to be having a special hearing uh, about the extent of the jurisdiction of the Israeli Supreme Court. He certainly did not have hearings when the court started asserting its extraordinary powers to strike down constitutional laws and to remove the uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, so, given the general uh, pervasiveness of uh, international obsession with Israel. Um, you know, this is, you know, these are things for Israelis to debate, debate amongst themselves. I think there's a proper role for, uh, you know, academics around the world to have a uh, to have a, a discussion. But political pressure regarding this, uh, I, I think, is fundamentally misplaced. The question of minority rights is a fundamental one, um, and, uh, and uh, it is, you know, it is the difference between a republic, that is to say, a, a limited democracy, um, and a and a pure democracy. Uh, and the question, and the question is, how much are those endangered, and you know, by by the system, and what are the best safeguards for it? So, um, you know, without having to look as far as you know the United Kingdom or Holland or France, which also have you know, parliamentary sovereignty systems, that is to say, ultimately the legislatures have the uh, have the last word. You know, I think it's enough to look to Israel, which did not have the current judicial powers until the past few decades where sort of one by one, the court started claiming various uh, additional powers. Um, and I want to say, if the only thing the Supreme Court did was assert that uh, a certain human rights legislation, basic law, human dignity, had constitutional status and started striking down things as violating that, or even interpreting that instrument very broadly to include doctrines that specifically does not include, like equality, if they had stopped at that, right, I think we would not be having this debate now. Right. Uh, I, I think that would have been tolerated, but it did not stop at that. It also asserted power to decide basically any issue in Israeli society or political life, including who's going to be the minister, who's going to decide, who's going to be in charge of uh, what government unit, who can be appointed to government commissions, even who can be the prime minister. And ultimately, after right, what can be in the documents that it claims is the constitution. Uh, and it is that sort of putting themselves above any law, uh, um, claiming to decide any issue um, that uh, um, that I think led to this current crisis. So I was, before 1995, the human rights situation in Israel, probably not perfect like in any other country, but was not known to be, um, to be uh, particularly severe. And you know the big question about human rights is why do we think the Supreme Court is such a great guardian of it? Right? We would hate to see the government shut down a radio station they disagree with, but that's what the Supreme Court did when they shut down Arutz Sheva, uh, a right-wing radio station that had been granted a license by the Knesset and was shut down, uh, shut down by the uh, by the court. That would be very uh, you know disturbing. Um, in America, we have notions of free exercise of religion, um, which would be offended by many of the Supreme Court's rulings um, about what ultra-Orthodox can do sort of in their, in, in their own spaces. Um, and these are divisive issues, but the point is it's not clear exactly what minority rights are or why a self-perpetuating court is a guarantee of it. And let me just close with this observation. Um, and this goes to the point of judicial appointments. Uh, under the system Israel has now, there would be no way to overcome Plessy versus Ferguson. The United States Supreme Court, right, that, uh, that said separate but equal treatment uh, by race, racial discrimination, is is okay, right? There'd be no way to override it. Lincoln gave a famous speech about this, said, you know, we're not going to defy the Supreme Court on the ruling of the case, but we are going to appoint judges who disagree with this and who are going to get us over time a different result. And this was an appeal against civil war. So we don't need war. We can overturn this eventually. Um, that did not work out, obviously. So you know, new justices were appointed, right? And ultimately, Congress passed the 14th Amendment to overrule Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, under the Israeli Supreme Court doctrine, it can overrule a constitutional amendment 
passed to change something the court did. So there'd be no way to overrule Plessy versus Ferguson. And then I want to say another thing about an important point Professor Dershowitz brought up, you know, the need for social cohesion, for agreement, uh, you know, not to have this div uh, divisiveness. You know, the American Supreme Court's flawed in many ways, but one thing we've seen, which I think is quite remarkable, abortion is the most divisive issue in American politics, right? And in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court decided that there was a right to abortion, which made so many people feel like the government was condoning murder. But it did not lead to a civil war. It did not lead to even what were, you know, the kind of uh, disturbances we're seeing in, in Israel, because people knew that they could vote for politicians who over time, gradually, incrementally, would change the approach of the court. Now the court has decided Dobbs, which many Americans feel strips their bodily autonomy, right, is sexist, is bad for women. Right? But they don't have to, uh, you know, block traffic uh, in the middle of cities because they know that there's a way to change it, right? And that mistakes are not permanent. The Supreme Court's current doctrine is what we do is permanent because we're going to pick people who agree with us to uh, continue in our positions. And we can even strike down constitutional amendments that disagree with us. Yeah, thank you very much. And just before we continue, I just want to say for our participants who are with us tonight that uh, there's a Q&A down the bottom of your screens. So at some stage, if a question pops into your head that you would like to put to uh, either of the professors or both of them at the same time, uh, feel free uh, to do that. Now, you mentioned uh, that it's inappropriate really for uh, the European Union to be uh, sticking its nose into Israel's business and so forth. But uh, protests have been taking place across the globe amongst the Jewish diaspora. And uh, these protests, are these protests justified or is it really just a matter, an internal matter for Israelis themselves to deal with? Because uh, many Jews in the diaspora feel as though there uh, are laws here that uh, could be uh, affected that uh, will influence uh, what it is to be a Jew uh, outside of Israel. Professor Who? Dershowitz? Yeah. Um... Most of the Jews who are protesting um, around the world have no idea what they're protesting. Uh, they don't like the result of the election because from their point of view, as my grandmother would put it, it's a shanda from the Goyim. Um, it's an embarrassment in front of the Gentiles. Uh, they don't like the result of the election. And as a the result, they're protesting. They have no idea what they're protesting. Um, and people don't protest uh, judicial uh, reform. And, and that's why Eugene and I agree on, on a lot. I think we ought to focus on what we disagree about. But, you know, I wrote a two-part article about why is the world obsessed uh, about this? I don't think the European Union, I don't think that the reform movement in America's uh, rabbis uh, should be dealing with these issues. Um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a surrogate for we don't like Netanyahu, Ben Gavir, and, and Smutridge. And if it would pass by anybody else, they, they wouldn't be uh, concerned about it. Um, I want to answer a couple of little points. Um, one, the Lincoln point, just dead wrong on the Lincoln point. Um, it just was lucky that Lincoln was the president. Uh, if it were two years later and Johnson were the president, he'd be appointing people who supported uh, not only Plessy versus Ferguson, but Dred Scott. Uh, and so there's no guarantee that presidents will make uh, better appointments than uh, commissions of justices uh, or commissions of academics. Uh, sometimes they will, sometimes uh, they won't. And I think the point is not who will overrule Plessy uh, or whether or not we'll see uh, permanency. It's what will produce better justices. The American system is probably one of the worst in the world for appointing justices. Um, the, the Supreme Court has been turned into a political institution uh, where it only matters uh, who the people are. Roe versus Wade was not reversed on principle ground. I was opposed to Roe versus Wade when it first came down. I thought it was uh, actual uh, extension of judicial power to an area that should be uh, political. But the only reason it was overruled was because people campaigned and it became a political issue, not a judicial issue. And, and, and the American system just doesn't work. Uh, the Merrick Garland, the Robert Bork um, uh, fiascos, the confirmation process is a disaster. Um, and that's why the Israeli Supreme Court for the most, most part has had much, much higher quality of justices than the United States Supreme Court. Just think about 
uh, Shamgar, think about uh, Agranat, think about uh, Barak, you might disagree with him, but he was the dean of the Hebrew University Law School, the leading academic in the country, the winner of the Israel Prize, the Attorney General of Israel, uh, Yitzhak Zamir. These people were so much better than the hacks that presidents appointed to the United States Supreme Court. I'm not in favor of perpetuating the Supreme Court. In fact, I would change the rules. Um, I agree with some reform. I would eliminate the veto that current three justices have on the committee and have only two justices or else have uh, uh, six votes required instead of seven votes. So I would change all of that. All I insist on is that the nominating commission, the group that makes the nomination, have a majority of non-politicians. I do not want Likud or Labor or any political party to dominate the election process. It's not broken. Uh, I think it can be fixed a little bit, but I would much prefer to see a commission of, of substantial, dignified people who look to quality. Wonderful story about that. When, Cardo when Oliver Wendell Holmes resigned from the Supreme Court in his 90s, his, the attorney general of Herbert Hoover gave him a list. And uh, the list were the 10 most distinguished judges in America, which is what President Hoover had asked for. And on the bottom of the list was a liberal Democratic Jew named Benjamin Cardoza. And, uh, and Hoover said, uh, it's a great list, but you have it upside down. Uh, I want uh, Cardoza, I want the best judge in the country. And the attorney general said, well, you can't. There's already one Jew on the Supreme Court. There's already two or three New Yorkers and he's too liberal. And he said, no, well, to replace Oliver Wendell Holmes, I want another Oliver Wendell Holmes on the Supreme Court. And he appointed Cardoza, who served with distinction. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that that's the best method of selecting. I just want to see meritocracy. Uh, I'm in favor of meritocracy in everything, in selecting pilots, in selecting doctors, even in selecting lawyers. I think we're seeing the death of meritocracy in the United States, and I would like to see it restored, uh, and I would like to see it maintained in Israel. And I think meritocracy has prevailed in the appointment process for the most part, which explains why the Israel Supreme Court was regarded, even during the times when Eugene disagrees with it, probably is the most distinguished Supreme Court anywhere in the world. It was regarded as the gem of the Israeli system. I don't want to see that replaced by a bunch of political hacks who are appointed as a reward for their service to Likud or any other party. So uh, my only compromise is I'm in favor of changing a lot. Uh, I'm, uh, as, as Eugene said, he would have no objection if all the Supreme Court did in the 1990s was to insist on maintaining judicial supremacy over issues like uh, equal protection, due process, uh, freedom of speech. And I agree with Eugene that there are complicated issues that the Israeli Supreme Court should not have closed down Arut Sheva. The Israeli Supreme Court should not have prevented the Koch party from running. Uh, Supreme courts aren't perfect. The question is, how do they compare with other Supreme courts and other courts? And so I would like to see reform. I, and, and I think if Eugene and I sat down together for a few hours, I bet we could come out with 80% agreement. And my reforms are twofold. That is, I would have the Supreme Court have supremacy only, only on issues of basic human rights, due process, minority rights, uh, freedom of speech. They would have no jurisdiction, either no jurisdiction or subject to uh, reversal by Knesset over the Lebanon gas deal, over whether dairy can serve in a ministry position, over whether the, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, prime minister can serve. I would have all of those decisions made by the Knesset, as long as the Supreme Court gets to have the last word on fundamental issues where, the, where, where you need to have a check and balance on majority rule. Look, the majority never likes free speech. Free speech is a minority right. The majority never likes due process for guilty criminals. I know because I defend a lot of those guilty criminals. These are not majoritarian concepts. You need a court. And you say, well, the Supreme Court is elitist. Of course it's elitist. Thank God for that. We want an elitist Supreme Court. We want a Supreme Court that doesn't put its finger to the wind and decide what the public wants now. We want the Supreme Court to serve as a check and balance. And I'm prepared to compromise and compromise by saying only two 
things have to be preserved. The nonpartisan nature of the Supreme Court, number one, and number two, its basic ability to make final decisions. And no decisions are ever final in a democracy because obviously justices change. You, you will get changes even during the revolution. There were changes uh, because the Supreme Court never can succeed in replicating itself. But all I care about is not turning the Supreme Court into a politicized institution where people are selected for their loyalty to the party, number one, and number two, preserving the finality of the Supreme Court on core issues, which I admit will be difficult to define, but they're difficult to define now too. Um, and, and, and I think because Israel doesn't have a written constitution, it needs that kind of elitist check on majority, temporary majorities. And so um, I'm curious whether, I mean, Eugene said he would not be objecting if the Supreme Court had just limited its authority. So can we agree? Can we agree, Eugene, that if the reforms made an exclusion for issues of basic core human rights, uh, that you would agree with that? And then we can talk about the selection process. Let's first ask, would you agree with a compromise? Because if so, I would bring it to the attention of the appropriate authorities. It's really what I, I spoke to Benjamin Netanyahu about this when I was in Israel. I spoke to the attorney general about this and there seemed to be relative consensus on that issue that if you just give the Supreme Court the final authority over core minority rights, basic human rights, due process, free speech, understanding that those are not self-defining concepts, that maybe both sides could agree to that. Before I, I turn it over, let me tell you why I don't think there'll be agreement. I think we will not achieve a compromise, even though the president wants to have a compromise, because both sides' extremes are winning. That is, labor was dead in the water. They couldn't get votes. They couldn't get anybody in the Knesset. Now they're having these demonstrations, and they're winning. They'll probably do very well in the next election. The extreme right, the Smutridge, Ben Gavir people, are winning. And when you have both sides' extremists winning, why compromise? The losers are the majority of Israelis who want some reform, but not total reform, and the country of Israel, the nation of Israel, the concept of Zionism. Those are being suffered. Those are suffering. And that's why I think it's so important to reject the extremes on both sides, move to the middle, and create a compromise that both sides can live with, even if they don't completely agree with it. It doesn't seem, though, as though neither side is willing to compromise, and that's why we keep on going no. week after week with, with this current situation. So, uh, Professor Kondorovich, I think you're invited to, uh, to respond to some of the things that uh, your counterpart has just said. Uh, yeah, so this is an area where we have a lot of both agreement and disagreement. I would say I'm more optimistic about compromise. Um, I'm here in Israel now. I can tell you there are active compromise uh, negotiations. Um, I, I think uh, I think Yair Lapid has more of an incentive to not go along with compromise politically than Netanyahu, because Netanyahu is prime minister, and Lapid wants to be prime minister, which for that to happen, the government has to fall, and creating instability you know, is better for him than it is obviously for uh, for uh, Netanyahu. But certainly amongst amongst people who we've had discussions with, um, there, there are there's lots of room for uh, for compromise because uh, it has never been the case that all of the aspects of the current proposal need to be passed or that they need to be uh, passed together or that they cannot be uh, modified in various ways. I think uh, Professor Dershowitz and I do have a more um, philosophical uh, 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 disagreement about judicial selection, um, which goes to the question of uh, meritocracy. Well, law is a mixture of uh, kind of technical skills of statutory interpretation and on the level practiced, you know, at the Supreme Court, significant amounts of, of policy. Uh, you know, it, it's impossible to have a, it's not, you know, in boxing, you know, two people walk into the ring, one's going to be the winner, right? One's going to be standing, one is not. Uh, you know, you can have two law professors have a debate, even if they disagree much more than Professor Dershowitz and I, and each per, you know, everyone is going to hear differently uh, who won. So um, I think there's not just merit, there's also policy and policy disagreements. Um, and you cannot separate, uh, you know, those two issues. Uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that all of the justices Roosevelt was thinking about, you know, uh, uh, nominating or whichever president you mentioned, you know, would be people ideologically sympathetic uh, 
And then the question is, who's the most qualified amongst uh, um, amongst those? Um, and I also don't believe that any person is free of ideology. So the, nothing scares me more. Let me paraphrase William Buckley. I would rather the Supreme Court be staffed by the uh, you know first fifteen names in the Ashdod phone book than by the uh, faculty of any law you know, uh, law school in America or um, uh, or Israel. And I say that as a as a law professor. Um, Nobody is objective and nobody is neutral. And the concern in Israel is that you cannot pick a body of academics or, or experts who do not have significant ideological and philosophical homogeneity, which will result in a kind of self-replication. And it's even more true in Israel where there are fewer universities where people hire their own students to be professors. Uh, this notion of homogeneity uh, is, is is very strong. And you'll see the Israeli Supreme Court doesn't reverse itself like the United States Supreme Court does. They never said, oh, we're, we're wrong um, because of this uh, homogeneity. So uh, I think expertise is overvalued, but I do agree with Professor Dershowitz that you know, a court can be a valuable check to immediate majoritarian preferences, right? Um, to uh, restrain present, to be uh, something that uh, is counter cyclical to present majorities. And, but what accomplishes that is life tenure for judges and the fact that not all the seats become vacant at the same time, right? That is to say, each government picks a certain number of um, uh, uh, justices. So at any one point, the majority could be counter cyclically oriented uh, to the majority of the public, but at the same time is never fully disconnected from the public. You know, appointment by experts can result by, by, by a court which has values fundamentally uh, different uh, from the public, and that can create a dangerous um, sense of sort of disconnectedness and despondency uh, by, uh, by, by the public. So the point is not that, you know, one government picks all the justices, governments rotate. You know, hopefully, and if they don't, that suggests that the parties need to update their platforms in a way that are going to uh, eventually uh, appeal to voters. But we've seen that the United States, just when one side despaired, oh, the other guys are going to control the court forever, it, it, change, right? it, it, change, it changes up. Um, so um, I think the appointment process needs to be linked to politics, but, you know, the life tenure of judges means the majority on the court is not going to be linked necessarily to the current majority in the Knesset. Well, that, that makes an important point. Where we disagree with is that I think there are issues where we want the justices to have views fundamentally different than the public. Free speech is a perfect example. Nobody supports free speech. Everybody wants free speech for me, but not for thee. I used to teach a class on freedom of speech, and I'd ask the students, how many of you believe in freedom of speech? Every hand went up. How many of you would make an exception for Holocaust denial? Bunch of hands go down. How many of you would make an exception for racial uh, discrimination speech? Hands go down. How many of you for sexist? How many of you, by the end of the class, nobody favored free speech? Nobody favors free speech. Uh, nobody favors due process for my clients. And sometimes I don't even favor them. They're such horrible, miserable people. Um, and that's why you need a permanent, permanent elitist group that fundamentally disagrees with the public perception, the permanent public perception, the permanent public perception in the United States, no free speech, establishment of Christianity as a religion, um, presumption of guilt for people who are charged with uh, serious uh, crimes, and it can go on and on and on and on. The only way for these rights to be preserved is to have a permanent elitist group that doesn't care what the people want. And I think, Eugene and I, we have a fundamental difference there. You talk about the difference between being a republic and a democracy. Uh, that's one way of putting it. But I think even a, a better democracy and a better republic, whichever way you choose to denominate uh, what we have or what we should have, should have a group of people that is totally dedicated. We used to have it in the United States. It used to be called the American Civil Liberties Union. They are dead in the water. American Civil Liberties Union today favors suppression of speech, suppression of due process. All they care about is woke culture and winning for the left. So we don't have a check anymore in the United States through NGOs like the American Civil Liberties Union. We need a Supreme Court. And by the way, even this Supreme Court, um, which disagrees fundamentally on, on abortion and on some other issues, 
tends to have pretty good agreement on free speech. Uh, our mutual friend Eugene, our usual, uh, uh, mutual friend Nino Scalia, who I disagree with about virtually everything on issues of free speech, we agreed. And he agreed that that was a very elitist concept and that it was something that if you ever put it to a plebiscite, it depends how you frame the plebiscite, but would lose. And so I think we have a fundamental disagreement about whether there are issues in a democracy which never, not cyclical, but never should be allowed to be decided by the majority. I think there are such issues. In that respect, I'm non-democratic. In that respect, I'm anti-democratic. I agree with you. These reforms have nothing to do with democracy. In fact, they probably enhance democracy. But for me, a good government is one in which democracy is constrained by basic core rights that are, to quote from the Declaration of Independence, unalienable or inalienable. And, uh, and those rights include the four or five that I agree to. And you seem to agree with those as well, even though we have uh, some disagreement as to whether you can ever define those rights. And, and, and you can't. And that's why the difference between the Israeli non-constitution and American constitution is largely illusory. Our constitution has words like equal protection, due process, uh, the freedom of speech. So those are just, the, those cry out for definition. It would be the same as if there were no uh, a constitution. And so it's the very fact that Israel doesn't have a written constitution like England that it needs to have this permanent elitist check on what the public always wants. Not only do they want it now, they never want, for example, hate speech. If you did a poll, nobody would like the constitution to protect hate speech, except you and me. And uh, we are elitists. And thank thankfully we have enough elitist justices to tell the public, we don't care what you want. We know what's best for you. It's very, very elitist. We know what's best for you. Allowing a marketplace of ideas, allowing free speech, allowing minority rights, allowing due process, we're going to impose that on you, whether you like it or not. And that's where I think we have an ideological disagreement. Can I just yeah, also, we, have practical, we have a technical, we have a practical, I think a factual disagreement. Um, because uh, I think even if one greatly values those rights, uh, and even if one thinks they can be defined with some specificity, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, I'm, I'm unconvinced that the Israeli Supreme Court has demonstrated itself to be uh, a good defender of those fundamental rights. And by the way, it is elitist in a way, you know, I agree that, you know, a written constitution and an unwritten constitution need not be uh, fundamentally different. But the one fundamental difference is in America, Everyone agrees a constitutional amendment can override the Supreme Court, and indeed it has happened on four occasions. Um, in Israel, the Supreme Court says it decides whether a constitutional amendment that it disagrees with is going to be uh, accepted, which is a level of above a level of elitism unlike anything in any democracy. Um, and, and that's a fun, that's a fundamental point. Uh, the um, the Supreme Court has not been great on free speech, which I think is the easiest value to uh, to agree on. Um, it has not been great if it allows prohibitions on what in the United States would be considered pure political speech. Uh, for example, campaigning, political campaigning, campaign advertising in the days before an election, which is what in America would be the most highly protected speech. You're talking about the election before the election. Instead, the Supreme Court thinks it's acceptable to impose gag orders on politicians uh, and then, of course, each politician can complain to the Supreme Court about who's violated the gag order more blatantly. And the Supreme Court, in the end, decides what political speech is allowed in the days before the election. That's, I agree. I agree. That's extraordinary. So, so I'm saying yeah. I don't think that this selection mechanism uh, has necessarily provided uh, for uh, uh, judges that truly uh, respect these rights. And I think minority rights are another example. Um, you know, which which is the relevant minority? In many ways, this was triggered by the question of Haredim and their status in society. And whether you, you know, like them or hate them, they are, in fact, a minority. And uh, the Supreme Court said, invented a doctrine of equality, which is not, which was specifically excluded from the basic law on human dignity, and said that not drafting, you know, they're, they're Israeli citizens, not drafting them violates equality. On the other hand, there's a larger percentage of the population, Israeli Arabs, 
who are also not drafted, and the Supreme Court doesn't say that violates equality. I think a system in which the question of military conscription for 40% of the population is in the hands of the Supreme Court, right? This is something that needs to be based on a social consensus, right? Uh, so, you know, I think if there was a system of rights that would be legislated, it would look different slightly from America because it would have to address this. Like there would have to be a, you know, constitutional draft exemption for, for Arabs and uh, and uh, 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 Haredim. And that gets us back to one of the reasons we're here. One of the reasons we're here is because Israel does not have a constitution. And until two days ago, when Yair Lapid thought that suggesting a constitution would be a useful way of sandbagging reform efforts, everybody knew that there could not be a constitution. The Israeli Democracy Institute, which is now a big proponent, um, our crosstown rival think tank, uh, big proponent of a constitution. If you look at the documents from just a, a year ago, they were saying, we all know nobody could ever agree on a constitution. So right. the bills being suggested now are not a constitution. They're ordinary legislation. That's very important for viewers to understand. They will be able to be reversed in the ordinary course of things by a new government, not even by 61 votes, by you know majority of the quorum. They're purely ord uh, ordinary legislation. And Legislation, what do legislators decide to legislate about? The fire, right? They deal with the crisis in front of them, not like other potential problems. Right now, there is a crisis. There is a Supreme Court that claims to be able to fire the prime minister. It has empowered the attorney general, which is a major part of this reform. I would say it's like 50% of the importance of this reform is the attorney general, who has is not a cabinet official in the traditional sense, but is really a commissar of the court in the executive branch that can veto any executive decision just by saying it's problematic, right? The security minister was going to transfer a police chief. The attorney general wrote a two-sentence letter, problematic, and it's frozen, right? So uh, that's a fundamental problem. You have an unelected official picked by other unelected officials um, who has supreme authority over every governmental decision, nothing to do with human rights. You know, unlike the court, the attorney general does not focus on human rights issues. She just says the government isn't doing what I think they should be, uh, uh, what, what I think they should be doing. That is the case right now, right? The prime minister is being barred from talking about the most important issue in the country. The court has said, if you pay, pass constitutional laws, like the nation state law, we can decide whether they get to be included um, in, uh, in the constitution while ignoring existing clear basic laws like the basic law calling for a referendum on the giveaway of national territory, which Yair Lapid did with a minority government a week before the election. Another fundamental point, why this, why this has to happen now, because that's a question people ask, why now, right? The Supreme Court invented a very crazy doctrine, uh, saying that a lame duck government is no longer, cannot, can no longer take important actions. They're just like, can only do housekeeping stuff. Because, uh, because it would be unreasonable for them to do so. It says that nowhere in Israel's law, there's many, there are in fact many laws about the powers of the Knesset, and they do not differentiate in this way. Supreme Court invented this idea. Now, we have had six, five elections in the past six years, which means we've had a lame duck government much of the time. Guess who's the final decision maker about everything during that period, right? And to give you an example, the Supreme Court said, Yair Lapid wants to give away sovereign Israeli territory to an enemy state, a week before the election, they said, that's not a major decision. In 1999, Benjamin Netanyahu wanted to close down the Orient House, the PLO's illegal headquarters in Jerusalem. So, uh, in the days before an election, Supreme Court said, you're not allowed to do that. It's too close to the election. It's a big deal. So these are things that need to be addressed now. And to say that they need to be held hostage to a complete agreement on a fuller set of issues is basically to say that they'll never happen. Um, because agreeing to a doctrine of uh, equality actually gives more power to this court. And the goal here is to reform the court. Once the court is reformed and its power you know, and made more accountable, then the, I think there'll be much more room and much more interest um, about discussing now that there's some check on them, now we can give them more power. But to you know, otherwise, it's just pouring fuel on the fire. No, I, I don't disagree with almost anything you've said. Um, I don't agree with the Supreme Court's decision that lame duck governments can't operate. You know, we had similar decisions in the United States, and they turned out very badly. Uh, for example, the blatant hypocrisy of the Republican Party when they said you couldn't nominate uh, Merrick Garland because it's eight months before an election, and then they nominated Barrett. 
uh, just eight weeks or a few weeks before the election. And when they were asked why, and the answer was, well, we can. Uh, that was why. Not a good, not a good decision, not a principal decision. You may like the result, but not a good principal decision. Look, I agree with much of what you said. I don't think the Supreme Court should have um, many of the powers that they have now. Um, and, 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 and that's why I would like for us to sit down and decide what can be done and what can't be done. Um, the attorney general is a unique concept in Israeli law, as is the judge advocate general. You know, there's a joke they tell in Israel. When the F-35s were sent from the United States to Israel, generally F-35s have two cockpits, one for the pilot, one for the navigator. But the Israeli version had three cockpits, one for the pilot, one for the navigator, and one for the, one for the advocate general who tells Israeli soldiers what they can bomb and what they can't bomb. Um, that has been a gem uh, of the Israeli legal system, that there are objective people like the attorney general and the judge advocate general who impose legal constraints on what the government can do. I, I think that's negotiable. I think that's something that people can argue about. Uh, and the attorney general, by the way, is selected by, in a combination way. Usually the sitting prime minister has some role in selecting, so does a a commission, uh, and the attorney general's role is unique. Uh, it, in the United States, we have something a little like that. Um, the Office of Legal Advice in the Justice Department is regarded as somehow binding. They're appointed just by, uh, by you know, partisan politicians um, and, and non-elected politicians. These are all issues that can be uh, discussed. Again, but there is a fundamental disagreement, and we should not move away from that fundamental disagreement, uh, two fundamental disagreements. Number one, I want to make sure that politics plays less of a role, partisan politics plays less of a role in the appointing of justice of the Supreme Court than you do. That's a fundamental ideological difference. And the other one is, although I agree with you, that the decision about what constitutes free speech and whether the Supreme Court's decision on not allowing elections, you know, we had a big decision in the Supreme Court of the United States, five to four, as to what kind of political speech is, is permitted in the run up to elections. All of these are closed questions. Um, I just want a fundamental statement by those who are in favor of judicial reform saying that however you define it, the Supreme Court will have final authority. It's never final because obviously you can overrule Supreme Court decisions. It's not done. By the way, in England, it's not done either. You never get decisions overruling other decisions in England. Most of the world doesn't have that. Uh, and in America, we didn't have it for years. It was remarkable that even in Plessy versus Ferguson, Justice Harlan dissented. Most of the decisions in the 19th century in the United States Supreme Court were uh, unanimous or near unanimous with, you know, handfuls uh, going the other way. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and sometimes the decisions can be eight to one, uh, like, uh, like uh, Buck versus Bell, probably the single worst decision um, in, involving individual rights in the United States Supreme Court history. And Brandeis and Holmes went along with that horrible decision, which was cited by Nazis at Nuremberg to allow the killing of disabled people. So, Courts are not perfect. I agree with you. And sometimes legislatures do better justice and protect free speech. Uh, and the Haredi examples are, are good examples. Um, the, the majority of Israelis uh, would probably prefer Haredi rights over Arab rights. Um, uh, if you, you know, Israel is a country that consists of Arabs, Muslims, Israelis, Christians, but it's the nation state of the Jewish people. And it's crucially important that the rights of Arabs be protected. And increasingly, the rights of Arabs can be protected legislatively because they form parties and the parties have now become more influential, particularly in certain governments than other governments. And Arab rights can be protected legislatively. But in the end, I don't think you can count on the Israeli public to protect the rights of its Arab citizens and, um, and, and, and you're right, it depends on who you define as a minority. If you define Jews, no, they're not a minority. If you define Haredi Jews, they are a, a minority. And uh, by the way, I do agree with you in the end that the decision who gets drafted 
should be a legislative decision, as it is in the United States. You know, in the United States, uh, there is a constitutional right of uh, conscientious objection, but it's a limited constitutional right. It basically is if certain people are exempted, then other people have to be exempted. The Supreme Court probably, probably could rule that there are no exemptions um, uh, across the board, that there's no recognition of conscientious objection. They probably could rule that. I'm not sure. But you know, here we're arguing about the kinds of things that you and I make a living arguing about, and that is the specific details of what constitutes free speech, what constitutes electoral speech, what constitutes minorities. All of that are very interesting and should continue to be debated both by courts and the legislatures. And I also agree with you that I think there ought to be a, uh, a check on the checks. And I do think that Israel ought to have a process by which they can effectively amend their non-constitution and overrule uh, the Supreme Court. But it has to take, like the United States, uh, a very, very, very large consensus. You don't get an amendment to the United States Constitution unless the overwhelming majority of Americans, the overwhelming majority of states, that's why we only have 20-something amendments to our Constitution. I'd be prepared to put a check on the checks into the Israeli system as well, and maybe, you know, an 80 or 90 uh, override uh, rather than a 61 override. That might be the equivalent of a constitutional amendment. So I'd be prepared to debate that as well. I don't believe in absolutes. Um, and, um, and, and, and therefore, I, I would hope that we can go back that, I, you know, in Israel, they say a, pes a, 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 an op a pessimist is somebody who says, oh, you things are so bad, they can't get worse. And an optimist says, yes, they can. Um, and you're, you're uh, slightly more optimistic. I'm not. I think that everybody's winning except the Israeli public on this, and the is Israel is doing terribly in, in terms of world opinion, Jewish opinion, and that's why it's essential that we sit down. I've offered my services, I'll fly to Israel tonight uh, to sit down with both sides. My two closest friends in Israel, the two people I have dinner with every time I come to Israel are one man I met in 1966, who's one of my closest friends, Aaron Barak, and another man who I met in 1970, Benjamin Netanyahu. They're both my close friends. I would love, I brought them together for my, I think my 60th birthday. Uh, they came together and, and joined in dinner. I would love to come and have the two of them join me for dinner with you and sit down and decide where there is room for compromise, where there isn't, and how to resolve issues. Like, for example, we're not going to ever decide to resolve the issue of how you select justices. We have a fundamental ideological disagreement. So then the question comes up, how do you broach uh, such a, a disagreement? How do you bring it together? What's the process for doing it? All of these things are issues that I would like to see together. I would like to see us resolve. And to me, and here we may disagree too, a bad compromise in this situation is probably better than sticking to one's pure ideology. I think a compromise is essential to the national security of Israel right now. And my think tank, Kahala Policy Forum, just uh, strongly endorsed the notion of, uh, of compromise. Uh, so I, I think it's crucial, absolutely, at this juncture. To uh, say something at this point, uh, we've got an audience that's uh, champing at the bit here, and you guys have been. Uh, running ahead at uh, breakneck speed, and it's been uh, hard to rein you in, uh, but uh, it's been uh, most illuminating. But can I just, uh, for, the, for the purposes of the audience, can I uh, pose a question or two? Uh, sure. The High Court of Justice on the 1st of February refused a 10th application for the adjournment of a case in which the court found that an illegal Bedouin encampment could be demolished and ordered the government to provide a plan of evacuation of the encampment by the 2nd of April. Is this interference by the judiciary in an area of government decision-making desirable? I don't think so. I think protecting Bedouin rights is one of the things that's absolutely essential for a court to do. The details, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at more carefully. But Bedouins are a perfect example of an, a non-protected minority. They have no representatives in the Knesset. Uh, they are 
They are citizens of Israel. They are a unique people uh, with unique needs and unique rights. And I think the Israeli Supreme Court has a role to play in protecting Bedouin rights. Yes. So uh, I don't know exactly what case they're referring to. If they're referring to the Kanal Omar case, it's not a really Bedouin rights case. It's a case about uh, squatters in a strategically important area uh, of uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank outside of Jerusalem, where there is a European Palestinian Authority funded program of taking over Area C to prevent the uh, to prevent any possible two state solution or to uh, basically cut off uh, Jerusalem. Uh, in this case, and the Supreme Court has ordered this community, uh, this basically squatter camp to be uh, demolished and the government hasn't done it. This is often used as an, an example uh, that, you know, look, uh, the left doesn't get mad when uh, the Supreme Court gives a, a more right leaning order and the government ignores it. Right. Because the government, the Supreme Court issued this order a long time ago, many, many years ago, and the government now has ignored it on many occasions. And the Supreme Court says, says I have to do it. I, at the same time, in, in, in the way I would think the Supreme Court should be structured, it should not be giving these kind of orders because individuals should not have standing to go and complain about how the government is or is not enforcing the law with respect to third parties, which is how these cases get to the Supreme Court, right? Who's complaining about the Bedouin squatters, right? In Israel, any NGO can bring a, a lawsuit and say, we think the government is not enforcing the law enough. And that fundamentally undermines prosecutorial discretion. But by the way, it is one of the major features of the system innovated by uh, the current Supreme Court that anyone can sue for anything because it means the Supreme Court can decide anything about anything. But I don't disagree with you on that. I think standing has gone much too far uh, under the, uh, 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 the Barack uh, revolution. I would like to see a return to a moderate view of standing, perhaps more than, than in the United States, but somewhere between the United States approach and Israel's. So, so we uh, can I just say we've got only a few minutes left because of the plan was only to do this uh, for the hour. But of course, uh, it's, it's quite uh, possible that we could have gone on for, for hours or, or days the way, the, the way we're proceeding. I've got another question uh, to toss out, which ties in with the one that I had about the possible ramifications that appear at the moment to be having a major impact on economic and political factors that would be very harmful to Israel. We've seen uh, what's happening in, in those two arenas. And Shoshana has asked, Israel cannot afford the indulgence of mass protest, divisiveness and distraction as our survival as a Jewish people is at risk. It is not only a shunder, but perilous. Two Jews equals three arguments is not amusing now. While we discuss constitutional issues, our immediate neighbours are having a heyday. Why, what should we be focused on right now? Well, first of all, I'm strongly opposed to those economists who are predicting that this disagreement and these judicial reforms will have a negative impact on the Israeli economy. There is no inherent economic reason why these reforms, even if enacted, should have any impact on the uh, economy. None of them have to do with economic development or the ability of companies to invest in Israel. What's happening is a bunch of left-wingers, many of them economists, are creating self-fulfilling prophecies. They are saying that it will have a negative impact on the economy and therefore causing a negative impact on the economy. I would bet you that, uh, that Eugene and I agree on that, that, uh, uh, that, that the people, a lot of opponents of this reform are weaponizing uh, the econ economic considerations uh, which will result in economic harm to Israel that would not have occurred simply as a result of whether or not these reforms passed. Yeah, I think the only clear harm of the proposal so far has been to uh, lead uh, uh, certain government officials to uh, try to scare people in a way that might have led them to move their money to the Silicon Valley Bank where they lost it. So that's a that is an economic harm, but very indirect. At the same time, I don't agree with the question that um, you know if these protests are somehow harming Israel's image, they should not be uh, tolerated. Um, I think uh, anyone who thinks that you know Israel is weaker because of these protests is is uh, completely misguided. Uh, 
Um, I think these protests show that Israel is a vibrant democracy. And also people don't understand, Israel is a Middle Eastern country. People talk differently. I guarantee you that if God forbid there were a war tomorrow, 110% of my countrymen would have their butts in their planes, tanks, or wherever they want to be. Uh, I, I have no doubt about that. I do. I have doubt about that. And I worry about it. I think that the um, refusal of people to serve in the reserves is outrageous. Um, and uh, I think there are certain issues that are red lines that you don't cross. And I think those who refuse to serve have crossed the red line. And um, and and I, I hope they will reconsider uh, their position. And uh, I think, look, the, the survival of Israel, threats from Iran, threats from Hezbollah, threats from Gaza, have to have first priorities. And you know, we can debate these issues and debate them reasonably. I agree with you that democracy is alive and well in Israel. It was Learned Hand who said during the middle of the Second World War. Don't count on the courts to save uh, democracy. Um, courts will do little if there are ever attempts to really bring about autocracy, as happened, of course, in Italy and in Germany, where, which had strong courts that did nothing at all. And he ended by saying that democracy and liberty lie in the hearts of men and women. And when they live there, they live. And when they die there, they die. And I think that uh, Israelis would never accept uh, uh, autocracy uh, uh, and, and a lack of democracy. The election results were democratic. I disagreed with many of them. And that was the sign of democracy in the protests. Uh, and I disagree with those in terms of the extremism are signs of democracy. So democracy is alive and well in Israel, will survive either judicial reform or the lack of judicial reform. And I think that if we can continue to have debates like this, like what we're having tonight, and 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 have rational discussions and move closer. That's why I wanted this to be a discussion, not a formal debate with a vote at the end. If we can have and move us closer together and 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 degree, agree to disagree about certain things and do not turn Israel into America, where old friends can't talk, where people have to choose sides, where you're either an anti-Trumper or a Trumper. Uh, those are not. Uh, ways that move a country forward. So I would hope that debates of the kind that Eugene and I have had and will continue to have uh, would be the way forward. So uh, we've got to our uh, end point almost. Uh, we uh, in Australia, uh, we're at, a, at not quite su such a favorable hour as uh, the time is in Israel and, uh, and the time for you, Professor Dershowitz in, uh, in America, we're running past midnight, and so uh, for the people who uh, were so brave to come on, wow. most of them are Australian, have uh, have, have managed to wow. stick out till midnight. But I've got one thing I'd like to ask you. I've heard it said that uh, this whole uh, furor wouldn't have necessarily occurred if uh, if Ben Gurion, back in the early days of the State of Israel, had turned the uh, the Declaration of um, of Independence. Uh, into uh, a uh, constitutional document is that would that have saved us from all this trouble? No, I don't believe so. Clear enough. It, it would it is a step forward, but you know, look, declarations of independence are by their nature different than constitutions. For example, the American Declaration of Independence is full of God. Uh, why you had to have God because everything they were doing was unlawful. Then they wrote a constitution. The constitution was very conservative. God isn't mentioned. Rights are not mentioned. There are two rights in the constitution against the Bill of Attainder and against uh, ex post facto laws. Uh, constitutions are documents of power and power allocation. Uh, you might say a Bill of Rights is comparable to a Declaration of Independence in some way, but constitutions are structural documents that uh, do involve separation of powers, checks and balances, and that kind of thing. So look, I wish Ben Gurion hadn't handed the power to make marital decisions and personal decisions over to the chief rabbinate. I think that was a disastrous mistake, but I don't think things would have been very different if Ben Gurion had declared that the declaration, which is a wonderful document, uh, is a constitution. I think it would be fine to say the declaration is basic law that has to be abided with. 
Yeah, there's a reason I think that uh, critics of the reform want to constitutionalize the Declaration of Independence, uh, which it's completely unsuited to being a constitution. It just doesn't address pretty much anything that a constitution needs to address, but it has a couple vague words in it, like democracy and the values of the prophets of Israel, which now that the opponents know that they currently control the court, that, wow, give them the prophets and democracy, and they'll be able to accomplish anything, right? Any any substantive result could be driven through those vague words. So I think it's a bit of a red herring. And similarly, you know, the Ben-Gurion made a very deliberate decision not to say anything about borders in the Declaration of Independence. He didn't say, we're accepting the partition plan, we're accepting the Balfour Declaration, because a Declaration of Independence doesn't do that, right? It's a... Uh, um, it's not its purpose. On the other hand, Israeli law does have a, the, our basic laws say a lot about borders. You need a referendum to change the borders. Jerusalem is the eternal capital; uh, can't can't be changed. So, um, you know, taking two words out of the Declaration of Independence isn't really constitutional making. I think it's special pleading. I agree. Well, thank with you. That. Yeah, thank you both uh, for all that you've uh, said tonight. Uh, from my from my perspective, uh, I think I'm going to. Uh, watch the recording when I uh, have an opportunity because it's uh, so, this has been such a dense discussion that I think that people will need to perhaps go back to the recording and and see uh, what was said and uh, and and understand uh, better really what are some of the ramifications of uh, what both you fine professors have uh, said tonight in our discussion I thank you very much indeed for uh, for participating and uh, and maybe uh, in the future, Jair will be able to host uh, similar events uh, like this. And, but I have to apologise as well to uh, to our wonderful audience who have patiently sat there and uh, been putting questions, which I have not been able to put to you, uh, fine professors, because uh, there hasn't been the opportunity to uh, angle them in as uh, we've been talking on uh, the subject today. Thank you everybody very much and uh, before we go I, uh, I need to thank uh, the, the fine gentleman who would normally be on the radio at this, uh, at this juncture. Uh, I'm referring to uh, Duane uh, Zigliotti who runs the Italian uh, music show which goes for, uh, for three hours from and but he'll be back next week. So those people who were listening to Jair and, and ended up listening to this instead of what they expected, they'll be able to go back to their usual fair next week. And uh, for those people who uh, want to contact the radio station at any point of time, our number is uh, 0404 eight, and uh, of course uh, info at j-air.com.au if you have any feedback after this uh, fine event tonight. So thank, uh, awesome. thank you everybody and uh, good night to uh, to people in Australia, good morning to uh, those who are listening on the US and good afternoon to everybody in Israel who has tuned in with us. Take care. Alan, it was a real pleasure. Thank My you, David, pleasure. for us. Do it again. Thank you. Thank you very much.